Good afternoon, everyone here in Hong Kong, and good morning to everyone in Italy. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, I'm Henry Chen from the Hong Kong Design Institute. Uh, I'm the program leader of the architecture design program, and I will be the moderator for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, for this Italian Design Day event. Uh, this event is organized by the Consulate General of Italy of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Design Institute. We're also supported by the Hong Kong Design Center, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Before we start today's lecture, I would like to invite Council uh, General Mr. Contestabile to have a few words, please. Thank you, Henry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the sixth edition of the Italian Design Day. Uh, the Italian Design Day was launched by the Italian Foreign Ministry to highlight how uh, design, creativity, and innovation address the challenge of today. Um, this year edition is dedicated to regeneration, design and new technologies for a sustainable future. We wish to investigate the role of design in promoting ecological transition and sustainability. This is an issue of course of crucial importance in Italy, in Europe and in Hong Kong where the government aimed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. It's therefore a great honor and pleasure for me to have with us uh, as ambassador of Italian design in Hong Kong, Mr. Mario Cucinella. Uh, Mr. Cucinella is widely well considered one of the most influential European architects and a leader, a global leader in sustainable architecture and design. In 30 years of career, he has designed many iconic buildings in Italy and around the world, which have received awards for their innovative solutions in terms of environment and energy efficiency. In 2006, I personally joined the inauguration of one of his most important projects, the Sino Italian Ecological and Energy Efficient Building inside the campus of Tsinghua University in Beijing. More recently, he has launched a School of Sustainability, teaching postgraduate programs in the field of sustainability in Milan. And he has designed the Italian pavilion at the 2018 Venice Biennale of Architecture. I'm sure it will give us much food for thought on the issue of rethinking architecture and industrial design uh, using innovative technology to promote uh, sustainability and positive social impact. These, I believe, are topic themes for a city like Hong Kong and its high density urban ecosystem. Sustainability will also be a key theme of the upcoming edition of Salone del Mobile, the most important design and furniture fair in the world that will be held from the 7th to 12th June in Milan. I hope that some of you, of uh, all of you, can travel to Milan uh, and visit the Milan Design Week in June. But without further ado, I wish to leave the floor to Mr. Cucinella and thank him for accepting my invitation to be with us for the Italian Design Day. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Council General. Uh, without further ado, then, Mr. Cochinella, please uh, start your uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll much. have a Q&A session after your presentation okay. later. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, before starting the, the, the lecture, I will thank the, the Italian Consulate for this invitation. It is a pleasure for me to talk with all of you. And thank you, Harry, for your introduction. And also thanks for all people attending this conference. It's really a pleasure. And I miss to be in Hong Kong. I've been many years ago and I really enjoy the time in, in that beautiful city. So uh, I'd like to start my speech to start to show some pictures here. Okay. Okay. And uh, so I'm starting with this. Uh, book we just uh, published last year with this uh, building green futures which is mean is not it's not about the buildings as as an object but really we must all together building the future of our planet and take care about 
the architecture because as you know architecture is one of the most expensive in terms of energy consumption and emission of co2 so but i, I like to also for the people who doesn't know my office is showing the environment where we have worked so we have quite a lot of people and we are based in, in Bologna as the first uh, office. Before it was in Paris, now we have two offices, one in Bologna and one in Milan. It's a kind of large community of 110 professionals. And as, as you know all now, the, uh, being an architect is not only design buildings, but increasing your knowledge in engineering, design, research, community engagement, model makers. So it's a very large community. What we'd like to call, we are an, a collective intelligence. No, I will be showing you in a while. No? And, and we are running many projects at the moment and in many parts of, of, mainly in Italy, but also in other parts of the world. And we are on the construction of land buildings. So I, I like to show this because I like to show the atmosphere and and this uh, group of people working together in architecture. But I just want to show you what is our world. So what, what, what kind of work we use and how we approach our building. The first, I like to give you some key words, which is inspiring us every day. You know? One is about sustainability, as you know, we use in this world quite a lot to do many things. And I always said, we must use in this world very careful because it's a very important word. You know, it's, uh, we don't have too many other words to say we want to sustain the planet. Or, so I like to use in this word for creative empathy, you know, because there are two very important words for architect, you know, creativity, of course, but the other one is empathy, you know, the, the way you, as an architect, but also as a person, you know, creating a relationship what is around the view. You know? so, and I think creativity combining with empathy is a way to control also and give a very important answer to this relation between building and climate, building and people. You know? So that's, I, is for me, the most important definition of what I like to say, sustainability. But also we learn something from plants. You know, it's a beautiful books and story written by Professor Stefano Mancuso, who is really a leading this idea that plants are intelligent. You know, plants, the plants, we can have a lot of things to learn from plants. And I like to say the office is now growing in what we call a collective intelligence. It's not anymore the office running by one person, but it's the combination of intelligence you know, to also to, to, for answer to the complexity of the world. You need combining all this energy and also the intelligence together to be able to respond to this uh, complexity in architectural urban design and design. But also the evolution of, of building. So it's a question with is a question to, my, to myself. So, what will be the future of buildings? You know? Considering that building is consuming more than forty percent, sometimes fifty percent of all energy produced. So, how are we going to design building in the future with the idea that in the next future, so in the next 20, 30 years, we design building with zero uh, zero emissions or carbon neutrality as the General Consulate say in his introduction. So I like to say we are in transitional area. No? Call, I call it hybrid buildings. No? We maybe need first to understand what is the relation between the building and the climate no? and try to get the best we can from the natural resources. So like solar, wind, raining. So how the building created this empathy. No? And then, when we find this relationship, which is an architectural problem, not a technical, it's an architectural problem, maybe then we need some technology, you know, because I think we live in, in, in much better condition than 100 or 200 years ago. But now, still, we're using the other way. We're using technology, and so many buildings, they're not window open. You know? Many buildings, 
they don't care about the solar radiation. So sometimes we using and 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 we using maybe too much energy. We don't need to use it if we can't find this this kind of relation. This picture is uh, showing a building we did in uh, Ghana in Africa, and you see the tree. You know we are in the tropical uh, area, and for a half of the time of the year, maybe a little bit more, temperature is about 23, 24, and the sun is hot. But when you are under shade, you know, the temperature here is good. It's a, almost close to the comfort zone. So if you make a building, you can see on the right side of the picture, we did this building for a uh, company in Ghana. If you shade your building, 100% shade, you don't need to cool the building for Two thirds of the time, so so we give an answer because we understand the climate and we give an answer in terms of architecture. Then the building is running air conditioned only in the peak moment when temperature is very high and high humidity, but for the rest of the time is a free runner. This is an answer. I think it is an architectural response. It's not a technological response. And also, we're working with new, new, new tools, you know, what we call a digital. You know? we, have, uh, we are already in the digital world, of course. You know? it's, uh, we can have fantastic tools. You know? we, we never had before tools like this, but also buildings, uh, they're still made by hand. And uh, also architects design. And I like, you know, to, I show you the picture. We like to uh, make models. We like to make with material. We like to touch things because this is, a, this is one of the most important part of our work. In this picture, you see we're printing a house, and I'll show you later in mod. And it was the first experiment made to make a, a building really with zero emissions and no energy because it was built with the with the first close to the house and we build by using a 3D printer. But also the, our work, you know, as I said in the beginning, is, is based on research because architecture has become more and more complex in terms of the tools, in terms of response, in terms of the program functionality, but also in, in the relation with the environment. So we, we have a, uh, a unit which is called research and development was find the relationship and research by what is around us, the climate, the plants, and try to, trans to, to transfer the knowledge of a natural world in buildings. You know? And uh, I will be showing you this picture is a project we did in Morocco for university and inspire, inspired by the cactus because cactus is really interesting plants which I will go a little bit in detail. But we don't need to make a building like a cactus, but the cactus can tell us about the, how many millions of years it was able to adapt into extreme cli climate and able to survive. So they maybe have something to tell us about the future. No? And also, as many architects, which I suppose are online, no, we, we work in a different scale, you know, from the macro, which is a building, uh, and a little object. You know. But the intensity of creativity is the same. It's a complex, complexity is different. But if you want to do a very small object, the intensity of work is the same to make a big building, because you need to do research, you need to test, you need to try, you need to make models. And we did a series of objects called, called building object but how we can transform our architecture in, in object, you know, not the other way around, how we make object and architecture, but how the inspiration of, of the design of building can inspire us to make an object. You know? And this is an object we did, a series of design. Mm -hmm. And also another important lesson for architecture, which I think is very important for all of us, is about Know, the social responsibility of architecture. You know. Be an architect is very, very important work, work. And also architects have full of responsibility. You know. I always say architects are very dangerous, you know, very dangerous because they're using something very powerful. You know, is they design the space, they design the building for people. You know. 
So, and you, you can make a beautiful buildings and give to people fantastic emotion no? and also find a fantastic relationship with the buildings. But also you can make terrible buildings and creating a sort of a clash with the community. No? And I like to say architecture is a common good. It's, it's made for all, it's made for the others. Sometimes it's important to remember that we design building not for ourselves, or we design building for the others, the other people living in that building. And I like design schools because school is a magical moment for kids you know, when they get inside of school. And then it's the first public space where they socialize. And architecture is something then travel in the memory. You know? And I will be showing some building which is, came in my mind when I was small, five years old, and I still remember. So, and always say buildings, they don't move, but they travel in the memory. All of you have a memory of living in some buildings or they have an emotion you know, in your, with your child, when you grow up, the most important part of your life is living in the space. You know? so, and I think that is a very high responsibility. And for this reason, we found that a few years ago, the school called SOS, School of Sustainability, is our social responsibility in the relation with the young generation. After 30 years of work, we thought it was good to give back to the young generation and knowledge about the sustainability, how you can reach the goals on the next 20, 20 30, 2050. Now our goals as European, which is shared with many, many parts of the world, how can design a low, low energy building, how we can design a new generation of building, how we can take a care of the social community. So I think the, there's a very high ambition in the planet how to reduce the impact of cities and buildings. So I think we need help. The generation of young architects and engineers because they now they are 25 years old. In 20 years, they will be leading the world. So I think for me, it was very important to share with them the knowledge, but also to share with them their vision of the future, because my vision of the future is different. You know? And I like to find a place inside of the office where we share. We give to them some knowledge. But they also give to us some vision about the future. And I think this is a, the combination of these two would be really a, a great opportunity to win this important uh, battle. So just to give you some very quick uh, uh, idea about what would be the next step. You know? So this is the is, is a roadmap uh, to, uh, to, to 2050. You know? We start with Kyoto Protocol. So in 1997 was the first agreement about reducing the impact of building. And I think as the the general council to remember, we, we did one building in China for Tsinghua University based in the Kyoto Agreement. So the, the, some country that give to other country the knowledge and, and the resource to make example of uh, the Kyoto Agreement and the Chiwan building is, is, uh, is one example of this collaboration. And then the COP21 in Paris, the first time then all government decide to sign an agreement politically how to reduce the impact of of the human in the planet. You know? And then you know, Pope Francis and then China achieve a Copenhagen emission reducing target 2020. So I think now is a great acceleration politically and also in terms of legislation how to facing this, uh, these goals. Architects, they have, a, again, a very high responsibility how to design this building facing this challenge. You know? But I, I just tell you some numbers, you know, just to know what is the great problem. You know? Today, we carry in the planet almost 170 billion square meters you know, of buildings. So the concrete around the planet is that, that uh, quantity. You know? But unfortunately, in, in 2060, so in the next 40 years, we're going to build more than what we built up today. So that's growing, of course, for the demographic uh, growth and uh, because there are a lot of building, building need to be changed. So 
it's 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 a it's a great planet ch challenge, you know. And and how are we going to build so much, so many buildings? How you can make so many houses, uh, offices? Every building needs a, a lamp, they need a fridge, they need a window, they need a structure. So all these material will be not available for this big number. So I think we need to rethink it, how we can use and reuse material, how use and reuse buildings, not facing this growth. And of course, China is leading the growth you know, in the next in the next six years, they're gonna build 20 billion square meters. So of course, that's one of the reasons is the growing the population. So that's for me is make me very responsible about what I'm doing because we know we have a very great challenge in front of us and architects have a very, very you know, great opportunity to give solutions to these problems. No? But just to give you an example of how CO2 emissions are distributed on the life of building, I put this diagram to say in a 70 years life of building, but this is more Italy, but like America is 15 years the life of a building, maybe 20 in China, I don't know, but Normally, the, uh, or Hong Kong, I don't know. The, normally, the life of the modern building is quite short. So we built and then we need to rebuild after 20 years, do it by regulation, technology. But if I take this diagram, you know, I say, we are concentrating for many years about the efficiency of building. But efficiency in this diagram is only 50% of CO2 emission. The other 50% is about the material construction and construction phase. So if you're reducing this diagram to 70 to 15, you can see the proportion, you know, the proportion of emission due to material construction and construction phase will be 70, 30. So we must, that's what we try, to in some way make more efficient building, but also working in the new generation material with low impact in terms of CO2 emissions. This is really the challenge. You know? And that's what we are facing today, you know, these ambitions. CO2 emission curve is still growing. Uh, as European, we try from 2020 you not know, to design building what we call net bed, which is nearly zero energy building, which is mean. This nearly is mean you can produce only energy with renewable energy, photovoltaics and ge geothermal. But design building with the low impact in thermal energy is not the same as we did before. So you need to take care. You need to take, you need to you need to be careful about how you design your facade, how you design your insulation, how you use in daylight. So the agenda is a change in thermal design. No? But looking at this diagram of 2060, you now we want to arrive to almost zero carbon, no neutral carbon. At the same time, the growth in the population and, and the demand of square meters is great. So how we can match this, this ambition? In one way, we want to reduce the impact. The other way, we need to build more. So I think that is our problem. So how we can reduce that gap? And I think part of this gap is in the end of architecture. So, and I want to give you a little bit uh, story which I, I think is very interesting you know i'm just published a little booklet called uh, the journey uh, can you take a the english one is the the future is the journey in the past you know? and uh, I, I think i want to show you then i will send to the general consulate this book because I, I like to get you the possibility to read but why i read that book I write this book because we, we, we're looking in the future like we want to go to zero emission, no? zero fossil fuel. That's, that's the ambition no? after 200 years, 250 years. But what we did before the Industrial Revolution, what, what we did before discovery of oil, gas, what, what, how we did. So I think we have a knowledge for a thousand years of design building in the past. We know energy. So, what I'm saying, we don't need to design building as the past, of course, but what we can do, we maybe study and discover the knowledge, how we did for many centuries buildings. 
be no energy. That's what we want to do in the future. So I think sometime we need to look at the future because it's in front of us, of course, no? The innovation is in front of us, but what we need to do and the future is strongly connected with our past. So we need to rebuild that bridge of knowledge from past to look in the future. I just give you a very quick, simple example. No? I did this book because I was thinking before the COVID, make a, 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 probably a journey through the world to get some, which I call some very important appointment in buildings. No? And starting from, from Italian villa, there was a design to increasing the natural ventilation or in Iran, the jackal, the house of ice in the middle of the desert where Marco Polo discovered in this trip when he back from China, then people offered him an ice cream in the middle of the, the desert of Iran or the wind catcher in Pakistan. So or the beautiful step well in India, you know, build the, the Maharaja building, building in the other underground instead to build overground. You know? Or the Chinese, fantastic house in Henan province, you know, it's excavating and beautiful master plan. So I like the idea that maybe we need to look in the past and not in nostalgic way. Yeah, I'm not a nostalgic person, but I'm curious to know how they did, how they make so beautiful buildings, how they make so incredible, different in many countries. They're all different buildings you now. And why we are building the same building everywhere. So, and that we have more knowledge in them than before. So this for me is a question. I don't have an answer, but I show you some example, how I can use this knowledge to design our building. And of course I make this, uh, this example. Of what is the difference of a, a tree in the building? What is the difference? What is the same? What, what, what make these things in common? What is in common between the two buildings? The two, the building and the plant. They both don't move. A plant and a building, they don't move. They stay in that place. You know? So, but what, what is the difference between the two? You no, know? is, is the different is a plant do a lot of things. You no, know? is is creating humidity, absorb CO2 and transform in oxygen. And then roots, they looking for minerals. And they are intelligent because they know where they need to go. And then they create a sort of a humus when the leaves fall down. And when there are leaves on the plants, they make shade of shadow. No? And also a tree make fruit. And if you cut a, tree, a branch, the, the branch is growing again. So you can look at the plant and say, wow, 45 millions the plants living in the planet so they may be have an, a lot to tell us about adaptability of the climate change they can tell us the resilience how they was able to resist to different so many things i look at our building today almost the building is against the climate you know they're all sealed you know, there are no open the windows i don't want to know what's happening outside because i have a machine you know and technology is, of course, increasing our better life that we discover is not exactly that. And then is a machine then bring you air in every room and then uh, but the building is closed and building producing CO2 emissions or other gases emissions. No? They don't collect in water. They, they mainly is a building is against nature. No? Then if the machine is broken, the building, you cannot survive. So. I think between the two is a big difference in terms of knowledge. You know? So we need to improve the knowledge of building. It's what I call creative empathy. We need to, de to do this, to do, to do this kind of analysis. And then buildings are important for us, you know, because building is the place where I'm, I go to school. You know? It's a place of knowledge. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise of technology, innovation. So buildings are very important. So I don't want to say buildings are bad. I want to say we need to improve the intelligence of our buildings. And that is the great difference. And that's what plants can tell to us. How to make with no energy, adaptability, you know, producing resource, creating the best condition to live in relation of climate.
So that's for me is our challenge for the future. No. If I make a sort of a of, of duel between buildings and plants, you know, the plants don't move, buildings don't move. Plants producing resource, building consume resource. Carbon absorption or tool production, only carbon production. So, but of course, the different that we cannot live in a plant, you know, of course, then we need building to live, but for our life, we need building, as I said before, to do our life. You no, know? but I think in the last two centuries, we forgot this relationship with the planet. Also, our change condition, now there's many, many people, the metropolis is coming bigger and bigger, it's not easy to solve that problem. But if we talk about sustainability in building, we need facing that problem, we need to discuss. We have time, no? we have time, we have 2030, 2050, so we need to use this time to find solutions, discussing between the community of architect and engineer. We need to discuss with politicians. You know? We need to, for a moment to stop and understand what will be the future of our cities. You know? you know? And what, what we can learn from, from plants for human design. You know? I, I like the ideas that maybe we can study the organization of the ecosystem to understand how plants, they live together. What, what is the principle of plants living together? And maybe transfer this knowledge, how the plants are using common resource, how they help each other, how this relation is built. And, and look in the city, we, we grow fast in the last 200 years. Too fast, no, because we need. We need to grow, we need to make cities, no? Maybe it's time now, facing the effect that we grow more and more to really have a moment of thinking about what will be that future. Okay, I, I start to show some of, of the project and uh, we get a very extraordinary experience working with the WASP, it's a company in, uh, in my region. They, they built a 3D printer, but the point it was, it's a long story using mud to make building from our past. This is Burkina Faso in Africa, but it's in many, many countries. Also China, also Asia, in many places in Africa, in Europe too, because that was the material available. No? And we thought if we want to really answer to the question about sustainability, we need to broken the paradigm because we all talk about uh, zero emissions, zero emissions, but it's not true, no, it's not simple, it's not so evident. So we decided to print the house with the mud, hurt was on the garden, you know, just digging a hole, take this uh, hurt mix and using a 3D printer to print the house. You know? and, 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 and why we did that? Because it's an opportunity of new technology not, not only the printer, because the printer is a simple machine, is the digital world. I can design buildings, adapt to the climate, and then with the printer printing in a different shape, in different location, based on climate, or in high vulnerability context, no? like uh, we also always give it to the, the country where they have problems, you know, like containers or tent. You know? Why we don't give something temporary, but good for living. You know? And, and, and then this was our site work. This is, of course, is a digital images. But the idea was, I can build with the mud, with the hurt. I can build this temporary place and then come back to the nature when we finish to use. No? But also it's interesting then, maybe we don't need to bring the same house everywhere because different latitude, you know, they have a different answer to the shape, you know, like a cold climate, we say it's Sapporo, or Bologna, Italy it is a temperate climate or hot arid climate, like Africa, part of Asia, South America, and Australia, and, and, and like India, you know, hot and humid climate, like in Hong Kong too, you no? Know? So maybe I can design house in different climate with different shape, like this is hot climate in India, which I need to increase the ventilation. Natural ventilation because it's air moving fast. You know, they reduce the 
the temperature by evaporating our water in the skin. That's get a feeling of, of reducing temperature in your body, you know. A little house underground, an open patio, you know, to get the benefit of the temperature, constant temperature of the ground. Or in the north, if we call it Sapporo, you know, maybe it's a, it's a very compact floor of shape and a big window to catch the little light during the winter time. So, and then make a village. Why we cannot design? Now we are in the process to design the second experiment here in Milan. We'll be ready for the salon, eh? so I invite you to come, of course. So, but what, what the key point of this, exhibit, this project is about the wall how you can design the wall to improving the thermal capacity of the building, how you can ventilate the building and protect the building from the sun. No? So the, all the design was about the thickness of the wall, the ventilation of the wall, how we can structurally keep in together the building because building in, in, in mud is not so simple. No? That are some pictures of the digital picture. And I show you the real, and that's is our village, and then is our village when this, maybe in a very fragile context, this building come back to nature is on the third. So, and then this idea of renovating and recycling and be back to nature as plants. So now is a video which I hope you can see. This is the site work. And uh, this is the printer. This is uh, the system of printing. And it was the first time this company called WASP was able to put in together two printers together and connecting and make the buildings two, two domes in the same time. I hope so you see. Henry is okay. And it's uh, interesting then it's only take it 200 hours to build. So yes. I'm not sure this will be the future, but for sure is an experiment that was broken one paradigm. We can build building zero emission and we know CO2 emissions. The printer is a very simple tool. So no, we don't need, a, uh, we need only a little bit of electricity to make these things work. And you mix the mud with a little water to find the new, the right density. And then that's it, that's done with the house. That was a really great experiment. And then, okay, we're facing some of, you know, there, there was never built with, with this machine a building we heard. And you can see the final pictures of also what's happening inside. That's the real one. And I tell you, I think our body have some experience in our DNA about this relation of materials because for many, many, many years, hundreds, hundreds of centuries, now we are working with, with the earth. And my feeling when I was inside is connecting with nature because I feel the material. I think you can feel it when you're inside of a concrete box or metal box or glass box, you get a different feeling. But when you're inside of a earth, you really get something different. You know, your body is kind of refined something ancestral, no? That's the building and then, and then we'll select for the COP26 in Glasgow in the pavilion of the sustainability. So we do different things. Now, this was a running by the, the research unit with the SOS school student which is not student really other professionals but 
we, do, we did this. And uh, this is a headquarter of an insurance company we do in uh, Milan. At the moment, the building is almost finished. It's a skyscraper. But, I mean, skyscraper is difficult. It's, it's not an easy project. But we try to find some ideas about how you can make a better skyscraper. So this building is facing south for the, the large part of the elliptic, elliptical. And we're using this atrium, which is 23.4 floor high, as a climate moderator. So that's, of course, not enough to run the building, but it's, it's help. You know? So in the winter time, we're keeping this heating by the glass house effect, you not know, to, to heating the floors, uh, combining with the heating system, which is actually is using the geothermical. So we're using underground water to cool and to heat the building. And in the summertime, we ventilate it, so we take away the heating from the office and we reuse the heating to cool the building again. And of course, is a, is a beam, is a modeling, is a building information modeling, you know, to do together so all the components of the building, which is the new frontier of how to design buildings, you know, it is, it's a grasshopper system to design some piece of the facade, but also we do modeling, the model, real model, you know, this is do with our model maker. You know? <clears throat> and then is the canopy in the main piazza. So the building is a double skin uh, buildings and when the, this external skin come down, almost the piazza is open like a, like a wind, take up this facade and create a great canopy you know, in our auditorium. And this is the space I told before. You know, this atrium open with plants is a is a life is a living place. You know because the air move inside, the plants reduce the impact of the of the of the sun. At the same time, create a sort of humidity. And and the top of the building, so you can see, is a garden, is a, is a glass house, and is a lounge. So and it will be the, one of the most beautiful place to see Milan. But also this place is no conditioning, so it's only running by ventilations and and uh, protection sun with the solar photovoltaics panel, and then will be uh, uh, a garden. So the top of the building, which is the most part, important part of the building is, is this. So this whole picture of the under construction. We now almost, we have another year of work. So it's, uh, that's almost done. And that is the eye in the top. The building is cut like this. And this should be the glass house. And top floor is the top management. But just to expiring, okay, uh, check time, sorry. Okay. So for a second. Yeah, I'll just show you another few projects. And this is the headquarter we built for the regional agency for prevention environment. I was inspiring by the Hamidabad, you know, um, wind catcher in, in Pakistan. And then the same here we, is a building which is made by 112 chimneys, only one floor, and catch the light and at the same time increase the ventilation. So what we do is in, in, a, in the summertime, you know, we open the vent to be behind the, this chimney, and then we increase the ventilation, take fresh air from the garden. At the same time, in the summertime, in the winter time, we're keeping the effect of a glass house, you not know, the effect of producing heating behind the glass to eating the system, eating the building. So that's not enough, but you see in the summer, it reduces 30% of, uh, okay, 30% uh, uh, of demand of energy and in, and in the winter time, 40%. So, it's not zero, but it's, it's good for, um, it's all wood construction. And also we did a lot of work on daylighting, how we can improve the quality of light inside of, of a building. You know? And that's our goal, you know? how to design building to improve the quality of life for people, especially for work 
people asking two things you now the quality of the daylight daylighting and the quality of the air so fresh air or natural air and less air condition so it's all in good construction and uh, i go quick here and this you can see in some of these chimney there's a photovoltaics to producing part of the energy for the common space i just want to finish this and then open to the question which i i like to answer to your question we did this uh, nursery school in uh, in, in, in Italy and was basing in this thing, sorry for the Italian, but it was very important to say architecture is the edu educator. So for a kids go to school, the way the building is made is a form of education. So the building tells you something. And this was my kindergarten when I was uh, four or five years old and was still the member. So, and then was designed by famous uh, modern architects in Italy. Giuseppe Vaccaro, and I still remember. So that's, I beg to my first thing to say, we really don't move, but they travel in your memory and you must be careful and memory that will be good. You know? And based on the Pinocchio story, you know, it, it, it's, it's a father Giuseppe waiting for Pinocchio. And then for me, the inspiration was this one. So this is the, the, this is the belly of the whale. You know? And then it's a continuous, you know, daylighting, food, natural material. You know, kids, they like to touch everything, but they like to lick everything with their tongue, you know? So you need to be careful when you design a building for kids. You know? That's our context, you know, is, a, is a trees to, on the plane, you know? So it's a very repetitive building, but this center is all classroom, all glass, and you can see all the kids, the little room for sleeping, and all place is using for kids. Like this is the main classes, and the entrance of the classes, this is the lab, and these are the other side when they're very, very small kids. And then these are the labs. So we're using corridors and space in transitional space to or using all the space for do some activity and that's it so uh, i maybe stop here and uh, uh, i open question are you Harry? Uh, yes hi me? thank you uh first of all just want to thank you for a wonderful lecture uh to me as an architect and as an educator it's very inspiring uh of what you said um especially about you know taking responsibility and having empathy i think oftentimes we just forget about our our responsibility right as a designer uh we're all in this world together uh you know there's only one world right if we destroy you know if we destroy our own home, then where do we go? So I, I think I really appreciate your, you know, sort of um, insights about how you are approaching these uh, uh, world problems, and also at the same time how um, you're taking a very positive approach. Because I, I really appreciate the fact that you said we still have time. Um, oftentimes we hear people say you know, it's coming, it, it's the end. And so what do we do? So I, I, I think this is really inspiring for us. Um, having said that, uh, we have been collecting some questions on social media and as well as in the Q&A section here, I've organized some of them. So um, maybe I raise the questions and see how we can continue this discussion. Uh, yes. The first question is about um, meeting environmental sustainability criteria has become very much a number crunching exercise. Uh, in Hong Kong, we see random patches of green and an abundance of unused recycling bins and new developments. Uh, how do you suggest we educate people about sustainability to get to the roots of the problem? So that's the first question. Okay. Well, I think the education is one of the most part of that story, you know, because we, I think we still also developer, you know, they still have the same attitude, you know, a little bit speculative, you know, and, and you know, we, we lost this relation with climate in the moment Then you think buildings is only a financial problem. You know? mm -hmm. So buildings is much more complex activities, you know, is a, a financial things, but also it's a social 
is also technology, is about how to live together, is an environmental problem. So I think in the last few years, I'm saying maybe more than few, no, the world of development, they're really looking for building as only a, 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 as a business, no? Mm -hmm. And they don't really care about all the other issues, you know? I think the, the most important thing we can do now is to improve the education in schools and university. And I think the young generation of architects, they're much more aware about these problems. And also I see in the last few years, the more developers, more and more, they're looking for more sustainable approach in their building. So it's a moment of change, it's difficult. And we have this attitude to no, not considering the future as an opportunity, you know, but to only to see the present, you know, how we can make our money now. And I think using and reusing buildings will be a fantastic, fantastic design opportunity. I, I was in Dubai a few weeks ago for the Expo. Mm. And this building built in 1990, in 2000, they're out of time, you know, it's all glass. And then they need to push so much energy to cool that building. So that will be not for too many years, you know? So it's a big challenge, I think, also in Hong Kong, you know, it's a lot of glass building, you know? How the young architects can make an interpretation of new facade to be more adapt to extreme climate and reducing temperature hmm. in building, you know? how we can do that. If, if you know, we face in Europe this problem of a war in Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine. And the major problem now, the discussion is not about only about people, which is a drama. You know, the war is a drama and that would be terrible, it's terrible. But the main politics discussion is about how we can find oils and gas mm. because they know we are depending so much that we cannot find another solution, which this is wrong. You know? I think we need to start to think in other solution. We need to think of a more green diplomacy. We need to think in their architects. They need to suggest more opportunities and more solution to find a way to consume less, not to consume more, but less. So I, I think this is on our end. I, I, like Harry said, we have time, but we need to use it this time to creativity, you know, to find solutions, you know, and, uh, and this is our job. Great, thank you. Um, another question. Uh, at the start of your lecture, you mentioned there's a huge difference between plans and buildings, uh, and later reiterates uh, when you were talking about the flow of natural light. However, some structures like um, Johnson Wax building by Wright uh, and the PMP building by Ito are famous with the enclosed space and, uh, and the top lit interior with no view to the outside whatsoever. So uh, he wants to, or this uh, audience wants to ask for your opinion on this. Well, the, the front row right, this building I visited many years ago it was one mm -hmm. of the most beautiful buildings I saw. Yeah. And uh, I think. I think the great architect also in the past, they really always want to deal with natural light you know, because it is a, is a material of architecture. I mean, Le Corbusier talk about this, you know, is volume architecture is mainly, is mainly done by the light, the shadow and the light. So I, I, th I think all sensitive architects, they always find this relation with the daylighting and, and, and creating uh, comfortable space, you know. I, I, I know that building of right in Johnston Wax, which is a fantastic. And I, I was very impressed, which is, I try to follow with very high difficulties, the quality of details, you know, how people, how architect was able to design so many details. Everything is designed from, from the lift and the bottom you push to, to go up to the chair, to the table, to the structure. So it was a kind of a full design, which I, I really, for me, is a very, is a very important. As many Italian architects in the past, I say Carlo Scarpa, Franco Albini, as many architects was dedicated. Architecture is not only some to build volume, but it really the capacity to go inside of so many details, which is make the beauty, you know? The beauty of things is because people take care about every detail. And people recognize this, you know? When, when you go inside a building, when this poor design, you feel the poverty, you know? You feel it's, it's no good, you know? And uh, when you go inside some building where maybe not mean expensive, but care, 
the people design with attention and detail you find a uh, relation with beauty, which I, I, I think is one of the, our most, most interesting part of our work. Mm, agree, agree, absolutely. Uh, another question, uh, how can 3D printed structures be used to show mon monumentality? Uh, as some structures are shown with the playing of materials and others are shown with their gar uh, gargantuan status. Uh, but there seems to have a clear limit to the 3D printed houses. Uh, I guess uh, that, that's the question. I guess um, if I'm to interpret it, well, I guess it's asking about the limitation to the technology and the sort of uh, application to how we can move this into you know, larger buildings, larger scale buildings. Well, you're right, absolutely right. This is a limitation, but I want to tell you then, this is only the beginning. It's not the end of the story. That's only the beginning. Well, mm -hmm. We've never done before. So I'm sure, I know the limitation. Of course, it's difficult to build two floors and more difficult to build two, three floors. But I look in the past, I say, you know, in Yemen, you know, the city of Sana is, is a 14, 15 store buildings made in mud. So they did. They did. It's a city built down. It's almost skyscrapers. So mm -hmm. we are not able to do now. But for me, it was not a challenge to say, I find a way to build a city in mud. That's not the point. The point is here, I start to make the first time a building, which is answer a main question, how to make zero impact building, how I can make zero emission building. That's the answer to that question. Now it's open to all of us, all of you, to thinking about how we can improve. Maybe I beg to the idea that maybe it was too extreme because building only mod is a serious problem, no? It's a problem of structures, it's a problem of uh, relation with the uh, raining. So it's a many problems. No? I, I don't say I find a solution. I only find a problem. So now we are working with other company to find a good mix between mod, like 80% of mod, and maybe 20% of material more with more technology to keep in together and maybe grow one or two floors or three floors. So maybe it's not 100% of mod, it's 80% of mod, but it's still 80% less concrete, which is, I think is good. And I, I challenge myself about the aesthetic. What would be the aesthetic of a printing house with 80% of mud and 20% of cement or new kind of cement? So I think, as a, because it is a very common question. Can you build a city of skyscrapers? No, I cannot build a city. This is a, the first step of something that we need all together make more experiment, more experiment, and then maybe we able to say in the next few years, we can build a building with 50% of material which a high impact in CO2 emission, maybe 60, maybe 70, but we go in a sort of a, what we call tra ecological transition. Oh, it's moving slowly, slowly with high technology to another way to make buildings. But I tell you, Next June, we build a new house here in Milan. No, oh, great. It will be a fantastic experience. It's a little bit different than that one, but it's more realistic. And, and the market, when we build that building, you know, the people from all around the world, they ask us to build this house. In the desert of Arizona, on the north of America, in China, in Australia, because people find some connections. Oh, we can build with hurt. Hurt is everywhere. I don't need to send any concrete. I don't need to send any steel. I can do. And then you only need a program and a very simple machine. This 3D printer machine is, you know, it's very simple. So maybe we only open a discussion with an example and and now up to many other people to find other solutions. But mm -hmm. I think we've broken the paradigm. Because we all talk about CO, zero CO2 emission in building, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because any building is made by concrete, steel, and glass, aluminum. No, we, we would like, but we can't now. So maybe we need to open another door to see, oh, this is another opportunity. And now researching and work. And it's yeah. fantastic. I, I also absolutely agree. I, I think with this mentality, if we just 
question but without solutions or proposing solutions then we're, we're basically stuck right we, we we cannot innovate so um yeah certainly and would love to see you know this new milan uh housing prototype because you know if it's adaptable to everywhere else in the world you know that that could actually create massive solutions to a lot of problems that a lot of places would have with climate uh, i think we have time for one more question so uh, maybe we go with this one. Uh, your involvement with the COP26 is remarkable. Uh, hmm. What are your thoughts on policy making in terms of how architects, the public, and the government can join together to build better living environments? Uh, this is a tough question. <laughs> uh, well, my, well, I think the COP, the COP in Glasgow was uh, not very successful, no, but I still was good than was in the agenda to show to the political people and the government that there's the need for another way to make buildings and impact on the world. I think, you know, politicians are very slowly change. You know, they, they only answer to question of today, not about the question of 20 years. That's not, unfortunately, they do not have a long-term vision. And, uh, but I think, this event is a worldwide event with all government are together. The, the, the government are facing a problem then we put under that conference and say, you must do something. And I think more we say we must do something than people protest like the young of Friday for Future young generation go on the, on the street to say, we need to save the planet. That started a few years ago, no, with Greta, and then is a, a young generation in every city in the world that protests to the planet. And politicians, they need to give answer to people. They must give an answer. So now we are in the middle of area that industry pushing because industry pushing to make more money, more buildings, which is of course nothing bad. And the other the, the other side is a architects, engineer, and, and some politicians, a young generation say, okay, but we need to grow in a different way. So it's, we are in a moment which is an hybrid moment. No, we have ambition to do it, but the political politician is slowly to change. But you know, the climate change is gonna put on the table questions and politicians need to be answered. When people are gonna lose their house because uh, water rising, no? Or oh, when they like today in Italy, you know, it's more than two months, no rain, and this agricultural problem. So the people start to say, why? Why you not do anything? Why you not make any policy to reduce that? Why you not make any design or prevent? Or what is your policy for the environment? So I think the question arise in proportion of the problem arise. So and politicians, they need to find a way to answer. And I think architects can be very very important for this debate mm -hmm. because they have they need to design cities they need to improve the quality of cities they need to design better buildings so i i feel in the futures more than today architects will be play a very very important role to push political people push the government with interesting solution so that's why i think architects are very important mm -hmm. Yes, I, I would agree. <laughs> but also, you know, um, having that continuous conversation is very important. I think what you yeah. said about the government or governments and policymakers needing to answer to people's needs, I think that's always something that, you know, that could be continuous because the world changes, right? Uh, I don't know if you want to have, if you have more time for maybe one more question, because I see a lot of questions popping on. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, and please. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll go with this one. Uh, this is uh, Edwin Lau from uh, Green Earth. In Hong Kong, commercial buildings have changed to use glass facade instead of concrete uh, over the years, which you mentioned, uh, which I think uh, will consume a lot more energy for cooling the buildings in tropical climate. So what advice do you have uh, to our government and developers to achieve much higher energy efficiencies in Hong Kong? Yes, I, I agree. <laughs> you know, we, 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 you know, it's um, it's interesting. If if you put a new regulation like like you know, in Europe, you no, know, it's almost impossible to do full glass buildings. Almost impossible because 
if you put a very strict regulation about consumption and uh, and insulations and you know reducing the, the the kilowatt to cool your building and if you want to cool or eat in your building you only need to use renewable energy you need to be very careful about you make your facade because you need inertia you need to have two less uh, solar radiation so and i think that is important of rules you know because if you at the moment, it's, it's a sort of a voluntary architecture. So we do it because we believe, and we have some clients that believe it's, it's the right to do it. But if you don't put regulations, you know, it's, it will be very difficult for the market to give that answer because it's so easy to build a glass building. You know, it's one piece, tak, 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 and it's, it's fast and it's, it's sometimes cheaper. Mm. But rules are very important, no? because if you can say, like, we, we did, and I, I have no time to show you all the buildings, but we did a building for university, you know, and, and the question on the table said, you must design a building with a nearly zero energy. You know? So first, you cannot use in full glass, that's for sure. Second one, 70% of the building need to be opaque, high insulation. So if you say to architects and, and the developers, so, Next generation of skyscraper need to be 70% opaque. What is the aesthetic of this building? So it should be not anymore a glass facade. No? You need to find the size of the windows, uh, how you can deal with uh, daylighting, how we can improve the insulations and the inertia of the buildings. No? There, there are people very good in many countries, they know how to do it. You know? mm -hmm. So, and I think that's the challenge. You know? and, uh, and, and, I, I think we'll be arriving in one way or another in the moment and the reduction, the, if we reduce the, the energy possibility, you know, if we have less fuel, we have less gas, we have less energy uh, disponibility, we need to design better buildings. So that, that is a challenge. And I think there are some very good examples, you know, how to shade the building, how to have more inertia inside of buildings. And, and I think open a, a fantastic opportunity to see a new aesthetic of sustainability, you know, which is maybe not anymore a full glass, but it would be more design, more composition, the facade, the opaque and transparency. I think it would be a, a nice challenge. Or using triple glass, but you know, that's really very expensive. You know, it's become too much. I think you're, you're, uh, in your bio, you said that you approach design with a holistic approach, right? So I think yes. this is part of that, that you don't just think about the glass or certain materials, but to consider all aspects of the building if it's to perform yeah. properly. Yeah. Uh, maybe one last question. Sorry, so many questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, you said multiple times that buildings don't move, just like trees. Uh, what do you think about tiny houses that are constructed on trailer trucks? Uh, some of the tiny houses are all off the grid, meaning they have solar panels and have a big water tank, making housing more sustainable and affordable. Do you have any interest in making tiny houses uh, more popular and attractive? Yes. Well, you're right. There are some houses, but uh, we, we designed many years ago a house called 100K house, you know, 100,000 euro house, and it was full of a grid, you know, because we only need 30 square meter photovoltaics to make 100, 100 square meter house to run it completely free, you know? And I think that is an interesting thing because you can, you know, be autonomous out of the grid. And I think this is really a challenge for many areas on the planet. You know? Not maybe difficult in a dense city, but in, a, in other area is a, is a great opportunity. You know? Then it was done in our past, there was people living in the countryside with nothing, no, no energy, nothing. So only sometimes no running waters too. You know? mm -hmm. So if you learn, like you know, and a very a perfect example is a sailing boat. You know, if you're sailing in the boat with with the wind, you know, you don't have running water. The only energy is the wind, and then you need to adapt your trip based on what energy is available. Mm -hmm. Then you don't. You don't. You only use water for what you really need. You don't don't throw away water because water is only numbers of liter. Then you cannot go faster of the wind. So you need to manage that energy to get to your point by using the best way you can use that 
that that force. You know? So that's a really good example of how people, when they sell it, they try to use the better and use the better natural resource because the only thing available. And I can imagine, I think there's a beautiful story in the desert of Arizona and Texas and in many places. And in 1970, 1980, it was the communities. Mm, they yes. built a house in the desert with a bottle of water or so pneumatic or using things. It was the hippies, you know, but they, their idea of nature and uh, try to find this empathy to using and reuse material and living with a minimal resource. I think this is not anymore only as something I say, uh, it's, in a while, there will be no option. <laughs> yes, yes. No and then option. design it will be fantastic. No, you can design a house and you can live with minimal resource. It's beautiful to do it. You know? And then move. What I'm saying, they don't move like a tree because the skyscraper doesn't move. A little house you can put in a house, like right. the camper. No, you can, and and then it will be a fantastic. No, no it's thank for the question. Hmm. Definitely difficult to achieve in a place like Hong Kong where land is no, limited, Kong, but. You know, I think that's where, you know, if there's a problem, then we need to be innovative and come up with solutions. Um, thank you very much. I, that's, I think, all we have. I uh, don't want to overrun too much. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Cochinella, uh, for your wonderful lecture, uh, really inspiring. I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the Council General of Italy of Hong Kong to organize this along with uh, Hong Kong Design Institute. So I uh, hope that you know, everyone can dial in and keep track of uh, all the events that we have coming up. And also thank you, uh, I think Joseph Wong just turned on his camera. He's uh, uh, showing up on behalf of the Hong Kong Design Center. Uh, so thank you uh, for your support. Uh, we will have more events coming up. Actually, uh, maybe just a little promotion. Tomorrow, same time, 5 p.m., we have a master lecture from uh, Patrick Schumacher from uh, Saad so uh, please, join if you can. Uh, there will be more details on the Hong Kong Design Institute website. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Kuchinella, for your, for your time and for your wonderful sharing. Thank you, Ali, and thank you, Clemente Contestabile. Thank you for the General Consulate and also the Minister of Culture and Foreign Affairs who organize, organize this worldwide event. And then Italian culture will be present in every country in the planet i think it's a very good things that's thank you very much thank, thank you, very, you much. very much bye 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 yeah bye. thank you enjoy your evenings and your day thank you everyone thank you